Thank you. You may be seated. And as you're being seated, you might want to fasten your seatbelts because if we're going to get through on time, we're really going to have to fly through this next part. But last week, as I was visiting around in some of the vacation Bible school classes, I, I stopped in the, I made sure that I stopped in the class where they were having the refreshments. And on the particular day when I stopped in that class, and the room was just full of people. And so we began to have a conversation with, with, with one another, and that's when what happened to Keith a few minutes ago began to happen to me. Because as we were talking back and forth, one of the children said, how old are you? I replied, how old do you think I am? Looking back on it, I'm not sure that was the wisest question to ask. Because all of a sudden, one of the children shouted out and said, I think you're 47. I looked at her and I said, I really like you. But about that time, another child shouted out, I think you're 74. I looked at that child. I did not say it. But I thought, you I don't like so much. <laughs> you know, you don't need me to tell you that we live in an appearance conscious society. We all want to look our best, don't we? And this explains why we spend literally billions of dollars each year to try and help make ourselves look as good as we can possibly look. Did you know, did you know that in the year 2013, Americans spent $12 billion on cosmetic surgery? And parenthetically, this was up a billion dollars from the year before. Did you know that in the year 2014, both men and women combined, their spending, they spent $55 billion on cosmetic products. And this doesn't even begin to get at the amount of money that we spend on, on jewelry. For Mother's Day alone, it was anticipated that $4.3 billion would be spent on jewelry. It doesn't begin to get at the money we spend on jewelry and designer clothes and fitness clubs and, and all the rest. We all want to look our best, don't we? Of course, it doesn't always work out that way. Old story. A woman was very concerned about the health of her husband. He was flabby, overweight, tired all the time. He, he was constantly stressed out and he was totally out of shape. And so one day she decided to take him to the doctor and after a thorough examination, the doctor came into the waiting room where the wife was waiting and he said, Betty Jo, I, I just don't like the way your husband looks. She said, I don't like the way he looks either, but he is good to the children, you know? So <laughs> we all want to look our best. And as it goes, there's nothing wrong with this. Looking good is a good thing. But do you know what the Bible tells us? The Bible tells us that God views things from a very different perspective than we view them. In regard to this, one of the most intriguing and fascinating stories in the Bible is the story of King David. In fact, if you have an hour or so sometime, you ought to just sit down and, and read the whole story of King David's life from the time when he first appears on the scene as a young shepherd boy to his defeat of Goliath, to his rise to the throne, to his affair with Bathsheba, to the death of his son Absalom, to his own death. In many respects, it reads like a novel. Well, our first lesson this morning comes right at the beginning of those stories, and it, and it tells of the prophet Samuel anointing David and of the promise that this young shepherd boy would one day rule the nation. As the author of uh, 1 Samuel has it. One day the Lord comes to Sa Samuel with a word. Samuel, I want you to go to the house of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, and I want you to anoint the one that I will show you. By now you will remember that King Saul had begun to be disobedient to God, and God had decided 
that it was time for a new king. And so the one that Samuel would anoint would become the new king of the nation at first. The prophet Samuel is, is understandably hesitant. He reminds God that if he goes on the errand that God intends to send him on, that there's a good chance that King Saul will get wind of it and that will be the end of Samuel. It's dangerous business anointing a new king when one king is still sitting on the throne. So God sends Samuel to Jesse's house under the guise that he will make a sacrifice. And when Samuel first gets to the house of Jesse, he has Jesse line up all of his sons and parade by him. Now Jesse doesn't really understand what is going on. Only Samuel knows what's actually happening. However, as each son passes by Samuel, the word of God to Samuel is, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And by the time seven of the eight sons of Jesse have passed by Samuel, God has made it clear to Samuel that none of these are to be the one who is to be anointed. And so Samuel turns to Jesse and in effect says, are these all of your sons? And Jesse confesses that, well, yet there is yet one other son, a, a young shepherd boy who's out in the fields keeping watch over the flocks. And Samuel tells Jesse to send for the boy. And sure enough, when, when, when David passes by Samuel, God says to Samuel, this, this is the one. And in a private ceremony in which Samuel anoints David, Samuel reveals to David God's intentions that he will one day rule the nation. Well, as I say, it is a fascinating story. But the thing that really captures my attention almost every time that I read this story is the instruction that God gives to Samuel right when Jesse first lines up all of his sons. Do you remember what he said? God tells Samuel, when making the choice, don't look on the outward appearance or on the height of the stature, for the Lord does not see as humans see. They look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Now, ironically, after David has been chosen. The author of 1 Samuel can't help but to tell us that David is ruddy and has beautiful eyes and is very handsome. But the author wants us to understand that that was not the basis of his choice. The question, how do you look? It's an important question. But the question, how do you look on the outside is not near as important as the question, how do you look on the inside? The inside. Well, in the time that we have remaining, what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite you to do a little bit of introspection. I'd like to invite you to ask yourself the question, how do I look on the inside? And the way I want to try and get at that is by asking you to, to ask yourself a couple of very related questions. First of all, try asking yourself the question, how do I look in terms of the faith factor? Personally, I'm convinced that one of the reasons that, that God chose David to, to be the new king is because God saw in David a willingness to trust God with all of the stuff of his life. You know, you don't have to read very far in the stories of King David to, to realize that David was not a perfect man. Now, David was a great man. He was a military genius. He was a giant killer. He was a musician. He was a great leader. He was a great man. But David was far from perfect. There were times when he could be brash and abrasive. There was later that adulterous affair with Bathsheba and 
David never really proved to be a very good parent. David was far from being perfect, but the reason David was called a man after God's own heart because, was because regardless of whether it was good or bad, positive or negative in his saintliness and in his sinfulness, David was willing to trust God with all of the stuff of his life. So let me ask you a question. Are you willing to do that kind of thing? Are you willing to trust God with the stuff of your everyday living? For instance, are you willing to trust God with your failures? Sometimes it's easy to trust God with our successes, but when we fail, sometimes it's much more difficult to see how God is at work in those. Are you willing to trust God with your futures? The other day I was in a meeting and we were talking about how a specific thing had not exactly gone as we had initially thought it would go, but the more we talked, the more we reflected how God had been at work in, in the whole process behind the scenes, working all things together for good, and how things had actually come out even better than we had initially planned for them. How, how willing are you to trust that God is at work in your life in that way? How willing are you to trust God with the resources of your life? And this is where things begin to really get a little dicey because I know people who will trust God with everything else, their families, their futures, their failures, but when it comes to their checkbooks, mm, they're not quite as willing to trust God with the finances of their lives. One of the reasons, one of the things that God saw in David that made David's God's choice for the new king is that David was willing to trust God with all of the stuff of his life. So how do you look in terms of the faith factor let me invite you to try asking another question. Try asking the question, how do I look in terms of the compassion component? The compassion component. Again, one of the reasons that I think the Bible tells us that God chose David to be the new king is because he saw in David someone who genuinely cared about other people. You see, for David, it wasn't just about winning in the battles. It wasn't just about building a bigger and a better kingdom. It wasn't just about making a name for himself. For David, it was about making life better for God's people. And this is one of the challenges that I believe that we face living in the culture in which we live. We live in a culture that tells us that we should constantly look out for number one. We're told that the one with the most toys wins and, and that the more you have, the better life will be for you. But every now and then, every now and then, something will happen or someone will say something and we will be reminded, won't we? That the, that the core, the, the key to life is not found in how much we possess, but in the people in which we invest. Not how much we acquire, but how much we pass along. Not how much we get for ourselves, but how much we are willing to give ourselves away for others. A few years ago, I attended a national economic conference. Now, how and why a preacher would end up at a national economic conference is a story for another day. But one of the speakers was Ben Stein. And if you're anything like me, whenever you hear the name Ben Stein, you immediately think of the part he played in the classic movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off, or, or maybe you think of some of the commercials that he has done. But interestingly enough, Ben Stein is actually a fairly well-known economist. And Anyway, he was speaking that day, and as you might expect, he was giving his predictions on where the economy was headed and why. But at one point, his speech took a bit of a turn. 
And, and, and he said to the people who were there that day, he said, some of you who are in here, and this is loosely paraphrased, some of you who are in here this morning think the real stars in life are the people who live near me in Beverly Hills. And some of you who are in here think that the, that the people who really get what life is about are the people who have impressive titles in Washington, D.C. He said, these people are not necessarily the real stars in life, and they're not necessarily the people who get what life is all about. He said, the people who are the real stars, the people who really get what life is about, are the people who make a difference in the lives of others, teachers and firefighters and social workers. Uh, they are people who volunteer to work with the poor and the homeless and the elderly and autistic children. They are the people who put their lives on the line every day to, to protect us. And he said, and they are the economists who realize and who do what they do, not simply to make a buck but to actually help the people that they serve. He said the reason that these are the real stars, the reason that these are the people who get what life is about is because they have discovered the secret that their sacrifice gives them a richness to life that money cannot buy. God told Samuel, when you make the choice, no look, on outward appearances. Look at the heart. Look at things like the faith factor and the compassion component. For as Jesus tried to, to tell us both by the things he said and by the way he lived his life, life at its best is never lived from the outside in, but from the inside out. And that, my dear brothers and sisters, is the good news for this morning. Our gracious and loving God, I look around this congregation and I see people, we all want to have big hearts. But to paraphrase what the man said to Jesus when he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, we want to have big hearts, but help us in the place, places where our hearts are small. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 707, Hymn of Promise.